worthwhile. All right. Take your Bible this evening, if you would, please. Open to the book of Colossians, Colossians chapter 1. For our scripture reading tonight, Colossians chapter 1. We're going to read verses 10 through 12. We'll read 10 together. I'll read 11, and then we'll read 12 together. So we'll read 10, 11, and 12. 10 together. I'll read 11, and we'll finish on verse number 12. Colossians chapter 1. And as our custom is, let's stand together to read the Scripture. All of us standing to read God's Word. Let's begin together on verse 10 of Colossians chapter 1. Ready? That ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. And let's pray. Father, add your blessing to the reading of these scriptures here this evening. And Lord, we're thankful for the wonderful music tonight that we have heard. Lord, thank you for the good spirit that's in the building this evening. Thank you, Lord, for faithful people who are in church on Sunday night. And Lord, we're asking now that you will continue to prepare our hearts, that we'll be ready to receive the truth from your word. Lord, I pray that as we listen to the special being sung this evening, that you'll keep our minds from wondering. Pray that you will help us to think about the words that are sung. And Lord, I ask you as it's being sung that you would tune our heart to your heart tonight, that each of us would have ears to hear what you would want to say to each of us this evening. And so, Lord, help us to focus and listen carefully for what you would want to say and do in each one of our hearts tonight. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. On a hillside, people were gathered, hoping to see him as thousands were fed, and he touched the blind man. He healed broken spirits. He moved with compassion, even raged from the dead. Once on a hillside, people were gathered. Watching as Jesus, he was crucified. No one showed mercy to the one who had healed them. Yet Jesus loved them as he suffered and died. Once on a hillside, <clears throat> the people were gathered, for Jesus had risen and soon would ascend. But then as he blessed them, he rose to the heaven and he gave them his promise. He'd come back again. We shall see Jesus just as they saw him. There is no greater promise than this. When 
and he returns in power and glory. We shall see Jesus. We shall see Jesus. Just as he is. Amen. Amen. It's good. Thank you, man. Appreciate that. Father, we bow before you in prayer now as we come to open up the only book you've ever written. We're thankful for the Bible. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to have copies of your word with us this evening. And Lord, I pray that tonight you'd help us to listen carefully and not take your word as the words of a man or the words of men, but as it is in truth, the words of God. And Lord, I pray it would effectually work in each of us who believe this evening. And so Lord, I pray that you would help us to give you our undivided attention for the next few moments, and you would help us to understand what it is to have a life that pleases God. For we desire to have a life that pleases God. I believe that people are in church on Sunday night because they desire to have a life that pleases God. And so open our understanding and Holy Spirit help us and be our teacher tonight. And bless and honor the teaching and preaching of your word. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. <clears throat> Paul writes here in Colossians, and by the way, not a unfamiliar theme for the Apostle Paul. In verse number 10, I hope you noticed when we were reading it, he's saying, he's, this is a prayer really for, him, for the Colossian believers. He says, ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. I want you to hold your finger there in Colossians because we're going to come back and look at what that means. But I want you to look over in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. That's right after Colossians is Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Notice again what Paul writes to the church in Thessalonica, to these believers. Notice verse 1. Furthermore then, we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us, how ye ought to walk into what church? Please God. What church? Please God. So ye would abound more and more. He tells the church at Colossae, I want you to walk worthy of the Lord and be pleasing to Him. He tells these believers, I, wanna, I want you to know how to walk and to please God with that walk. We know from the book of, well, while we're going, we'll just go in the same order here. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. The author of Hebrews, who I think was Paul, some don't believe that, and they're entitled to be wrong. But um, <laughs> Hebrews chapter 13, uh, notice what he writes here in verse number 15, where the Bible says, By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But to do good and to communicate, forget not, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. Well, that pleases God. Now look at Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4. A tremendous verse here in Revelation 4. Verse number 11. The Bible says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For Thou hast created all things. And for, what's the next two words? Thy pleasure they are and were created. Are you and I part of that all things? Sure. So why were you created? For His pleasure. In other words, I was created to please God. Why were you created? To please God. That's what, now, now, how does that happen? How does that take place? If I ask you tonight and, and, and I went around with the microphone and said, okay, tell me, what is it that pleases God? Tell me a life. Tell me what you have to do to live a life that pleases God. I, I would think we get many different answers. We may get some puzzled looks. 
we may get some folks who just be tongue-tied and say, I'm not sure what to say. Some folks go exactly or immediately to external things. Well, you know, you don't drink and you don't smoke and you don't chew and don't run with those that do. You know what I mean? Well, we don't dance or we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't. Are we, you know, we carry the right Bible. We make sure we have a short haircut. We go to church Sunday night, Sunday morning, Wednesday night. But those are all external things. Those are all just externals. It has nothing to do with the internal. And, and there's part of our, listen, the, the, the flesh, our soul, what we think, what we want, we feel, we always would rather just have a list. That's why it's so appealing for people to just say, just give me a list of what i got to do to please God and then I can check them off and say, okay, i got it. But God's never just interested in us living by a checklist. You see, what God is going to tell us here and show us in the book of Colossians is how we can live a life that's pleasing to Him. And He's going to give us some, some help, but it's not going to be just about external things. You're going to see here there's four characteristics of a life pleasing to God. Now, there, there are, I'm sure there are many more. But here, he just gives these four. But if you studied it throughout the New Testament, I'm sure you could come up with many more that God would give you. But the important thing is this. God is, God is making sure that all these things come from a heart that loves Him. That's uh, the, the first and greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind, all your soul, all your strength. And so God's looking at our heart. Salvation starts with the heart. With the heart man believeth unto righteousness. With the, with the mouth confessions made unto salvation. So it's always a matter of the heart. And God having our innermost being, our core of our being, devoted to Him. But here we are. And he says, notice verse 10, that ye would walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work. Well, there's your first characteristic. The first characteristic of being pleasing to God is being fruitful in every good work. So the first characteristic is simply bearing fruit. Obviously, if you bought a fruit tree and planted it, I would expect to get fruit from that tree. Now, it doesn't happen right away. You can buy a fruit tree, and I'm, I understand most fruit trees at the minimum are three years. Some take four or five years before you begin to get fruit off of that tree. But if the tree, after so many years, was not yielding any fruit, was not producing any fruit whatsoever, then I would feel like something's wrong with the tree. It's either a defective tree or... It isn't a fruit tree after all. <laughs> and I'm expecting something that isn't going to happen. So you can you might take it back to where you got it and say, I think I need another, another tree. Well, that's basically what Jesus said. Hold your finger there in Colossians 1 and look at Matthew chapter 7. Would you turn over there with me, please? First book of the New Testament, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 7. Matthew 7 is part of the greatest sermon ever preached it was preached by Jesus it's called the sermon on the mount it takes up Matthew 5 6 and 7 notice in Matthew chapter 7 in verse number 15 Jesus says beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly they are ravening wolves ye shall know them by their fruits do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth fruit, good fruit, is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. So God is simply, and He's just saying this, I think it's pretty, pretty self-explanatory. How can you tell if someone who professes to be a believer is really a believer? It's pretty simple. You tell by watching the way they live. Pretty simple. You watch the way they live. And, and you're looking for fruit. 
you're looking for an opportunity for them to show that they have life. That they have an indication that they are a believer or a follower of Jesus Christ. You see, our heart and our life go together. Your belief determines your behavior. My belief in Jesus Christ determines the way I behave. Okay? And, and it affects the way I live. That's why the Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God. First part of the next verse. So, we do remember this. Fruitfulness takes some time. We're not saying that someone uh, may, uh, just because we may not see the fruit, doesn't mean that it may not come. We, we said earlier, it takes a while sometimes for a fruit tree to begin to produce fruit. And it may take a while sometimes for a Christian to begin to produce fruit. And we cannot go around, the Bible never says anywhere, and particularly here he's talking about false prophets. But you understand, nowhere in the Bible does it say that you and I are fruit inspectors. Okay? That, that term isn't in the Bible. And nobody, you, don't label yourself a fruit inspector. I'm not concerned about inspecting anybody's fruit. I am concerned that I have some in my life. And that I'm producing what I ought to for God. And that God is making a difference in the way I live. Go to Galatians chapter 5, would you? You were in Colossians. Just before Colossians is Philippians. And just before Philippians is Ephesians. And right before Ephesians is Galatians. Galatians 5. Galatians 5 is a great contrast between those who know Jesus Christ as their Savior and are walking in the Spirit. In other words, when you walk, you take repeated steps in the same direction. So we're taking repeated steps in the same direction as the Spirit of God. Okay? As opposed to those who walk after the flesh or fulfill the lusts of the flesh or the works of the flesh, they're taking repeated steps after the flesh. What is the flesh? The soul leading my body. Doing what I think, what I feel, and what I want. Alright? That's walking in the flesh. So notice in Galatians 5, here in verse number 19, the Bible says, Here are the works of the flesh. They're manifest, they're made known, which are these? Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past, they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. That is, that is a life that doesn't please God. There's a list of things that you know those are things God is never pleased with. And they that do those things, the do is in a continual sense. You're, you're, you're doing them and you're doing them. That's your pattern of life. God says there's one thing for certain, that you will not inherit the kingdom of God. You say, are you telling me they're not saved? No, I think God just did. I'm just the messenger. Passing it on. And I want you to understand that. Now, notice the contrast in verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit, the outcome of a life yielded to the Spirit of taking repeated steps after the Spirit of God is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Notice, against such, there is no law. Did you know some of those things under the works of the flesh, there's laws against those things? Nobody's ever been arrested because they showed too much love, joy, peace. Long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Tell the guys at prison, anybody in here for love? <laughs> anybody in here for joy, peace, long-suffering? <laughs> no, there's no law against those things. See, there's nothing, nothing that would be displeasing to God. And notice, the, notice the, the drastic contrast between the two. That's the difference between someone who is in Christ and who knows Christ and someone who doesn't know Christ. That's the difference. It's light and darkness. 
It is a contrast of being a new creature and still walking after the flesh and doing what you want. Those who are living to please God begin to see a change in their belief and then they begin to see a change in their behavior. So what happens? Well, they, those who are living together outside of marriage get married. Those who are cheating others will begin to deal honestly. Is that right, Alex? Huh? He used to, he used to, he told us, he said in business, there are things he used to do that weren't honest. But he got saved. Now he can't do business that way anymore. Amen. Now he's got to be honest. Why? Because God knows. And there's something in his heart that he knows that that isn't the right thing to do. Those who've been abusive in their speech won't be abusive in their speech anymore. Some of you, when you got, before you got saved, you had a pretty foul mouth. Pretty wicked mouth. And, and some of you, you know, one of the first things that God began to clean up was the way you talk. The language began to change. And the reason the language changed is because your heart changed. Because it's out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. If you say, oh, I just, got a, uh, I just got a wicked mouth. No, you got a wicked heart. Oh, I just got to clean my mouth up. No, clean your heart up. And if God cleans your heart up, your mouth's going to clean up. Amen, Pastor. Those who used to use others will begin to serve others. Those who used to tear others down with whispering and gossiping, will now seek to build them up. Those who used to hoard their resources will begin to invest their resources in the work of God. Changes. Changes take place. What is that? That's fruit. Now how does that happen? Look at John 15 with me, will you? The Gospel of John, chapter 15. John 15. John 15 is the great chapter in the New Testament Jesus teaches about bearing fruit. He starts out by saying in verse 1, I'm the true vine, that's Jesus, and my Father is a husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Now watch verse 4, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in Me. Do you hear what he's saying? You don't set out to say, alright, bless God, I'm going to bear fruit. That's what I'm going to do. Jesus just said you can't do it on your, by yourself. You're not going to do it by trying harder. He said because the secret to bearing more fruit is abiding in the vine. Who's the vine? Jesus Christ. <clears throat> abide in the vine. Abide in Him. Abide is the word that means live in Him. Don't just occasionally visit Him. Don't just occasionally say something to Him. Don't, don't say, okay, I went to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, that's good. And then next Sunday you say, where's my Bible? Anybody seen my Bible? Huh? I'll say then, you're not abiding. You're visiting. Abiding means you live with Him every day. So you don't go out to bear more fruit. You seek to draw closer to the vine. You draw closer to Christ and you bear more fruit. He makes the difference. He makes the difference in us and through us. It's not a matter of trying harder. It's a matter of drawing closer. The, the, the measure of the church, the measure of a good Christian isn't how you behave when you're in this room. It's how you behave when you leave this room and you live out there the other seven days of the week or six days of the week till you come back to church. That's, that's the measure of whether you're bearing fruit or not. That's the measure of whether you're drawing close to Christ or not. A life, that glor a life that pleases God is one that glorifies Him every single day. So 
See, what frustrates the world who doesn't understand Christ, they only understand religion, is they don't understand why can't you guys just leave that at church on Sunday? We can't leave it on church on Sunday because it's not a religion. It's Jesus Christ. And He goes with us. Because He dwells in us and He lives in us and He's just as much with me on Monday morning as He is on Sunday morning. And He's just as much with you on Friday night as He is on Sunday night. We can't, we can't take it off, put it on and put it off. He's in us. And we want to draw nigh to Him. So how do we glorify God? How do we live day by day on the job? How do you treat the people you work with? How do you handle your mistakes? How do you treat people in your family? That's a life that bears fruit. We tell the men in the prison often because we, in fact, we started, when we first started the prison ministry, Danny made some of these calls. We would try to contact families of the prisoners. But more times than not, it was, I'm glad they're in your program, but don't ever talk to us about them again. We don't want to hear about them. We're done with them. They burned the bridges. They've hurt people deeply. And so we, 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 and I tell these men when they uh, have come and they begin to, they have to understand, I tell them, you know, people are skeptical of your profession because it's just jailhouse religion. But the real test is going to be not how you behave in here, but how will you behave when you get out. Will they see a difference? Don't talk the difference. Let them see the difference in your life. That's what it's going to take. And that's what it takes for all of us. Every one of us have known people, that, and, and we're all prone to talk it better than we live it. Don't be, don't, do your best not to be guilty of that. Let your walk speak loudly. And always let it match your talk. So that's bearing fruit, a life that bears fruit. Secondly, go back to Colossians 1. Will you look there with me, please? Colossians 1. <clears throat> a life that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. So a life that pleases God desires to know God better. Desires to know God better. I'm continuing to grow in the knowledge of God. Let me say a couple things about that. It is, not, <clears throat> it is not the same as seeking to learn how to get more from God. Most In, in our mentality, we kind of feel like we want to tap into God so we can get more from Him. So how do we know that's true? Because when we don't get it, we're kind of mad at God. How come I couldn't get that? How come you didn't answer that prayer? How come I did? How come they got and I? And we're thinking that okay, you know, are we ever big need? Well, I better get to church. You think well, I'll get to church. I'll get on God's good side, and He'll want to do something for me. You see, I, I, I I'm doing it so I can get something from God. Get on His good side. How can I get God to, to listen to my prayer and answer my prayer? How can I get God to meet my need? And how can I get God to take away my problem? But parent, let me ask you a question tonight. If your children only came to you when they wanted something, how would that make you feel? There are some tonight if I, who have grown children and you rarely hear from them until they want something. In fact, when the phone rings and you see it's them, your first thought is, what do they want now? Hmm? Does God ever think that of you or me? If your children just spent their life studying you to figure out how they could get more out of you, how would you feel about that? But there's some people who live their Christian life that way. Trying to see what we can get out of God. 
you'd feel pretty used. And when that happens, we're not loving God. We're using God. So growing in the knowledge of God isn't the same as just getting more from God, but it's also not just growing in knowledge about God. There's a difference between knowing someone and knowing about someone. <clears throat> you can spend all your time mastering information about God, but not know God. Mastering information in the Bible about God, but never know God personal, personally. There are people who can, can read things and, and quote Bible verses and say things, but they don't know God. They don't have a relationship with Him at all. I remember watching an episode of uh, Mayberry. You watch it too, don't tell me. And I remember they had a fella come in from out of town, a stranger, you know, and he stayed at the motel. But what, what struck him about this fellow was he knew everybody's name. And he didn't just know everybody's names, he knew, everybody, he knew everything about them. He asked, oh, you're Mrs. So-and-so. How are the, and he named the two little twins she had. And she's horrified that this stranger knows her name and the name of her two kids. He knew Floyd at the barber shop, and he knew Barney and Andy and, Shook their hand, act like he knew he knew them, and they're all puzzled. They've never seen this guy before in their life. How does he know all about us? Well, long story short, they're trying to figure it out, but long story short, he ends up, he'd been getting their hometown newspaper sent to him for several years. Any of you remember that one? And uh, that's how he knew all about him. Now, here's the thing. He knew all about him, but he didn't know them. Oh, he knew the facts. He knew names and dates and places and addresses and all those kind of things, but he didn't know them. He had no relationship with them. He just knew all about them. And there are people who are content in their life and don't be content to just know about God and not know God. God isn't content with you just to know about Him. He wants you to know Him. He wants you to have a relationship with Him. And be close to Him. Warren Wearsby wrote this. He said, In my pastoral ministry, I've met people who've become intoxicated with, quote, studying the deeper truths of the Bible, end quote. Usually, they've been given a book or introduced to some teacher's tapes. Before long, they get so smart, they become dumb. The, quote, deeper truths they discover only detour them from practical Christian living. And instead of getting burning hearts of devotion to Christ, they get big heads and start creating problems in their homes and churches. Boy, he knows what he was talking about. Don't. What does 1 Corinthians tell us? Knowledge puffeth up. Don't just be content with learning facts. There's always that danger of substituting facts for having a relationship with God. I want to I know God better so I can be closer to God. I'm as, listen, everybody tonight in the room is as close to God as you want to be. Because I just feel so far away from God. That's not God's problem. The problem isn't on God's side. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So he's, he hasn't moved away. He must be on our side. So when you read the Bible, do you just look for factual information or are you reading to know and learn about the heart of God? Do you look for direction in your life or you just look for information? When you pray and talk to God, is it all about what I want? Here's what I want, here's what I want, here's what I want. Or is it time to praise Him and to thank Him and to spend time with Him? Would you, are you eager to learn about the Lord? Eager to read things that will tell you more about what God's like and 
who he is. Even preachers can fall into that. You can read the Bible just looking for sermons. You can read the Bible just looking for things that, wow, that, there, there, that'll preach. You can't do that. I have to read the Bible for God to speak to my heart. To help me. To give me direction for my life. And I want to know God better. This is the only way you know God is through His Word. That's how we know Him. How'd you get to know? How'd you get to know your wife? How'd you get to know your husband? Yeah, you talked with them. You spent time together. Otherwise, you'd never got to know them. That's why when when a, a young man, a young woman, a young woman begin to to date each other, begin to have a relationship with each other, they spend time talking to each other. Sometimes hours. I told you about, you know, back in the day when you just have to pay for long distance. Do you remember those days? My wife had gone. I graduated high school and wasn't going to go to college anymore. I didn't, I didn't, you know, I wasn't going to college. I was just, uh, I was going to get a different career. And my wife went away to college down in South Carolina. And I'm in Ohio and we begin to make phone calls. Not we, me. That went well. That went well until the phone bill came. My dad came down with a, I think it was three hundred some dollar phone bill. Yeah, Whew. that's what I said. And so our letter writing began. Amen. <laughs> what was that all about? Getting to know her. I just got to meet her and begin to talk to her. I think it was only a week before she was leaving for college. Is that right? Seven days. And in those seven days, you tired of this sermon? You want to hear another one? <laughs> the I don't even know where I was now. <laughs> you got me. Getting, getting to know my wife. I didn't, I didn't want to get something out of her. I just wanted to know her. And, and that's how it is with God. You want to get to know Him. I want to know all about Him. Why? Because I want to please Him. Some people have no idea what, what will please God because they don't know Him. Mom and Dad... Make sure that your children don't just know what displeases you. Let them know what pleases you. So often children know what mom and dad don't want, but they don't know what they do want. And so when they do please you, let them know what pleases you. God does. He says, I want you to please me by bearing fruit. I want you to please me by desiring to know me better. Thirdly, in Colossians chapter 1, notice he says, you walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to His glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. Here's what I think the third thing pleases God. And you, 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 you'll really enjoy this one. If you're going to have a life that pleases God, you have to endure tough times. And be patient with difficult people. Endure tough times and be patient with difficult people. And you don't do that on your own. You're strengthened with all might according to His glorious power. And that strengthening according to His power comes into our life, I believe, in the person of the Holy Spirit and it shows itself in patience and long-suffering with joyfulness. We know from long-suffering in our RU program, long-suffering is that 
temperament that, that expresses itself with patience with the shortcomings of others. It literally means in the Bible to remain under something. And here we're remaining under, hanging in there if you will, the strength to endure it, and we do it with joyfulness. It's one thing to endure something and complain to everybody about it. And it's another thing to do it and maintain joy. Some people carry around sickness. Some people walk around and they have pain with them all the time. And you never know it. Because they're joyful. And others walk around in pain all the time and you hear about it every time you see them. And that's natural. If you're not going to do that, you have to be strengthened with His might according to His glorious power. You have to be strengthened by the Holy Spirit of God. Long-suffering is a fruit of the Spirit. Patience when you're dealing with difficult people. How can you be patient with people who annoy you, disturb you, and make you want to scream? Huh? You've got to have God. You've got to have the Holy Spirit. Or you just react with what you think, what you feel, and what you want. Your soul leads your body and you're after the flesh. Doing what you think you ought to do. God uses His Holy Spirit to remind us. It's such a blessing talking to the men in the prison and seeing them handle situations, being provoked at times by someone else, and then to see them, to watch them listen to the Spirit of God telling them, don't do that. Don't respond. Don't retaliate. Talk to them. And, and one guy said he, he, he got insulted and boy, he wanted to just let the guy have it back. And instead, he apologized to the fellow and said, I'm sorry. And Are you having a bad day? Are things tough? And he said, we began to talk and he said, and we spent the next 30 minutes talking. We became buddies. He said, that never would have happened before. But he listened to the Spirit of God. You see, the Spirit of God will remind you that He's in control. That you don't wrestle against flesh and blood. That your, your, your problem isn't your husband. Your problem isn't your wife. Your problem isn't your children. Your problem isn't your boss at work. You're not wrestling against flesh and blood. God's in control. And circumstances and people won't overthrow His plan. Cannot. He reminds me that God never makes a mistake. Never. Never. That He does what is good for me. I may not understand it all. I may not see it all. But His ways are not my ways and His thoughts are not my thoughts. His ways are much higher than my ways. And his thoughts are much higher than my thoughts. And he also reminds me at times I can get through difficult times because this world's not my home. I'm just passing through. And if it's just... If, don't, nothing in the world should get the Christian down very far because we're not here that long. I think was it, We were talking about that yesterday morning, Chuck. How, how fast 70 years go by. That's like nothing. I mean, you're 70 years or older in room tonight, you can't believe you're 70 some years old. Anybody like that? You remember when you were 15, 16, 20 years old, and you think, wow, where did those years go by? I know some of you are 20 years old think like that, I'll never get there. I know. Believe me, it goes fast. But hard times come, and we don't complain, we trust God. We don't despair, we. Stand firm.
when people are difficult, we don't react in the flesh. We respond by the Spirit of God. God will teach us patience with difficult people by reminding us that sometimes we're the difficult person. That everybody needs the benefit of the doubt. Wow, well, how come they talk to me that way? Wow, well, they didn't even say hello to me. Well, you know what? They may have been having a hard day. They may be having some other problems that don't have anything to do with you at all. And God is in the business of transforming people that I would have written off. I've seen God, I've been in this thing for a few years. As I said this morning, I haven't pastored here 63 years, but I just look like it sometimes. But you know, I've been in this long enough to know that God has used some people who I'm just amazed that He used. But then there's times that you have to stand back and say, I'm amazed God will use me. I'm amazed God will use me. Don't forget that. God can transform people's lives. God can change people. I've seen it happen. A life that pleases God bears fruit, desires to know God better, endures tough times, and is patient with difficult people. And then, fourthly, verse 12, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. A life that pleases God is a life lived with gratitude. Giving thanks unto the Father. Remember the verse in Hebrews, the, the sacrifice of our lips giving praise to His name. With that sacrifice, God is well pleased. You ever notice how much we complain? We complain about the weather. If it's summer, it's too hot. If it's winter, it's too cold. If it's raining, it's raining again. If it's sunny, man, it's hot. We just complain. We complain about our income or the taxes that take away some of our income. But you ought to be grateful you have an income. We can complain about our government, but we can be thankful we don't live in anarchy and we don't live in Venezuela. We complain about how the food's cooked or how long it takes to get to us. How long the waitress took. When we ought to be grateful to God we have food. Be grateful to God that you can go out and get something to eat. We complain about other Christians. Why? Well, because they're not as spiritual as I am. Hmm? We complain about traffic. We should be glad we can travel with such ease. Last night at this time, Emily was in Indiana somewhere. Aren't you? Now you're back here already. We're we're here tonight. My wife and I are going to go away this week. Going to take her away for an anniversary. By this time tomorrow night, we'll be out of cell phone reach. We'll be unable to be contacted. <laughs> And I can't take my phone out or I think she's going to throw it in the ocean. <laughs> Don't clap for that. <laughs> Amazing how we can travel. You get the idea? We thank God for what He gives us, but then at the same time we complain about why He doesn't give us more. 
you think you don't have a problem with that, just try sometime writing down, take a little three by five card, take a note, someone's better get a notebook, and uh, write down when you say something negative. When you just complain about something. You'd be amazed how often that is. Giving thanks. Giving thanks. Having that attitude of gratitude. I mean, God, why can't you just give me less problems, more money, more, more things, more influence, less illness, more good times, less difficult times. But hey, God, don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm thankful. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> Gratitude begins when we realize we do not deserve the things He's given to us. We are extremely blessed. Not only, hey, we'd be blessed enough just to have salvation. Just to know that I'm not going to die and go to hell. I'm never going to hell. I'm going to go to heaven. Hey, if Jesus comes, I'm going to heaven. If I... <clears throat> get a pain in my chest and I drop dead in front of you tonight, guess what? I'm going to heaven. This old poor guy, no, say, man, hallelujah, preacher went to heaven. That's a good thing. But God says it's not just heaven. I'm not just giving you eternal life. I'm giving you an inheritance. You are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, that blows my mind. Say, what does all that mean? I don't know what all that means, but I think it means something big. We're in the will. <laughs> We're in it. We're joint heirs with Jesus Christ. That's unbelievable. We get a gratitude and we begin to give thanks when we open our eyes to the blessings we often take for granted. What's the last time you just thank God for breathing? And Brother Rob was talking to me there before church. He's struggled last week just getting breath. Had to go on oxygen for a while. Don't take it for granted. When's the last time you thanked him? You were able to see the blue sky and the sunshine. When the last time you just thanked him, you can sit down and eat what you want. Paula Ross would like to do that. She can. She's going to get on the list for a small intestine transplant. I didn't know there was such a thing. She's not out yet. She, they, they didn't get things arranged down at this end with home health care and such. But once that, that is supposed to be in order, and I think it will be tomorrow sometime or tomorrow evening that she'll be discharged. Talked to her on the phone today. When's the last time you just thanked him you had a Bible? When's the last time you thanked him for the place you have to live? When's the last time you just thanked him for the transportation you have? When was the last time you just thanked Him you can hear the music we just heard tonight? What a blessing that was. Do you, have you thanked Him for your family? Have you thanked Him for the trials He brings in your life? Have you thanked Him for your employment? Just opening your eyes to the blessings He gives us every single day. That if we're not careful, we just take for granted. Now, when you think about these things, of being fruitful, increasing in our knowledge of God, showing Enduring tough times and patience with difficult people and giving thanks. 
being grateful to God for everything? Remember, this isn't about arriving. This is the goal we're living for. This is what we're striving to walk, to take repeated steps to please God. Nobody here has arrived. Jesus said, I do always those things that please Him. Nobody here can say that. I want to. I want to be able to say that. I want to be able to live that. But I haven't, had, I haven't arrived there yet. I doubt any of us have. But that's the goal. So don't get discouraged and say, oh man, if that's it. Phew, I can't ever do that. No, and you can't. You've got to have help. You see, God designed the Christian life that we would never be able to do it on our own. You can't do it in your own strength. You'll fail every single time. The Christian life isn't hard. It's impossible. And that's why God gave us the Holy Spirit of God to help us, to empower us, to enable us to live the way He wants us to live so we can live pleasing in His sight. The key is not to work harder. The key is to draw closer. The key is not to try harder. The key is to trust Him more. Several questions for you and we'll be done. Do people around you see your faith being lived out in your life? Do they see it in how you handle tough times? Do they see it when you, how you handle difficult people? Do they see it in the way you talk to people that are different than you? Do they see it in the way you talk about other believers? Look at your life. What do you see? Are you doing anything about growing in the knowledge of God? If, if we open up your life and we saw just how often you read the Bible, would you be embarrassed? Do you ever study the Bible? I know most of the time, preachers are just trying to get people to read the Bible. But, but the Bible does say study to show yourself approved unto God. Do you spend time alone with God? Are you living gratefully? Do you thank God daily for the blessings that surround you? My wife and I talked about it when we took vacation a few weeks ago with our family and Andy and Nikki and their children and our daughter and her husband and their three children and our other son Nathan. We all went and spent a week together. Do you know that's a blessing? Do you know how many families can't take a vacation like that? because people don't get along. That's a blessing. We're blessed. We thank God for that. That has to be God. Do you appreciate your salvation you have in Christ? See, this whole this whole thing of Christianity, it's not just a a hey, I'm saved, that's all that matters. No, 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 no. It's all about living a life that pleases Him. Why were you created? To please Him. We were created to bring pleasure to God. Are you fulfilling the purpose for which God created you? Are you pleasing to Him? Worthy of the Lord, as First Thessalonians tells us. Wouldn't it be nice if if someone could look at you, if someone could look at me and say, so that's what a life pleasing to God looks like. 
Wouldn't that be something? I pray God would make it so in each one of our lives. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, we bow before you in prayer. We thank you, Lord, for the word of God. Thank you for this prayer that Paul prays for the Colossian Christians. It's helped us tonight to understand a little bit about what pleases you. And Lord, I pray that tonight you would help each one listening here this evening that there'd be a great desire in our heart to live a life that pleases you. You're worthy to receive glory and honor and power, blessing for your pleasure we were and are created. And I pray tonight, God, that each one listening here this evening, listening and watching by way of the internet, you would minister to their hearts and we would bow the knee and say, God, I want to live a life pleasing in your sight. I want to abide in you. I want to draw close to you and bear fruit because I'm in the vine. God, I pray You'd help us to be strengthened in the inner man. We yield ourselves to the Spirit of God that we would have a passion to know You and to be enduring through difficult times and have patience with difficult people. Because you're orchestrating our life. You're in control, not us. And that in everything we would give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning us. Lord, may we care not what others think. May we care not what the world says. May we only focus on, am I pleasing to God? Help us. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I'll finish praying in just a minute. wonder how many here tonight would say, Preacher, the Lord has spoken to my heart this evening. There's a great desire in my heart that the Spirit of God is dealing with me. I want to live a life that is pleasing to God. There's some areas here that the Lord pointed out to me tonight that I'm going to ask Him to deal with in my life. Pastor, I really would like to influence some people to say, so that's what it looks like to live a life pleasing to God. Pastor, the Lord dealt with my heart tonight. Here's my hand. Pray for me, please. Would you slip it up right now, Christian? Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may put them down. In a moment, I'll pray and we'll have our invitation. If God has spoken to your heart tonight, respond to Him, will you please? Do what God's telling you to do. It starts just by bowing the knee. He's spoken to you. Respond to Him. Heavenly Father, thank You for speaking to hearts tonight. I pray that Your will will be done now in this time of invitation. That You'll hear our prayer we make on bended knee around an altar. And we'll present ourselves on that altar. People who desire to please their God, to walk worthy of our Lord. Have your way in each heart is my prayer, and I'll thank you for it. With your heads bowed, stand to your feet. As you stand to your feet, our pianist will play. As she plays, Brother Bob's going to sing. God has spoken to your heart. Respond to him this evening. Will you please? That's right. Oh, soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior and life more abundant and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His 
wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace through death into life everlasting he passed and we follow him there over us sin no more hath dominion for more than conquerors we are turn your eyes upon jesus look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace his word shall not fail you he promised believe him and all will be well then go to a world that is dying his perfect salvation to tell sing the chorus with him will you turn your eyes upon jesus look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace father thank you for this evening thank you lord for being a good god who does good things for us and thank you for letting us know how to live a life that pleases you and lord we want to leave this place now and we want to live the bible we've heard this evening we don't want to be hearers of the word and not be doers and so lord i pray that you'd enable us and help us may others see christ in us throughout this week use us to point others to christ this week help us to tell them about jesus we pray that you'll use us to be witnesses for thee lord we love you thank you for another wonderful day in the house of god thank you for our friends give these folks on their way to commonwealth give them safety as they travel and then mom as she goes back home watch over her and lord we're praying for the duncans as they head up to northeast ohio there give them safety as they travel on home tonight Thank you for them stopping and spending time with us this evening. Be with Sally, God, and direct in her life, Lord. Show her your perfect path that you have for her. Meet her needs. Lord, we love you this evening, and we thank you for our church family. Dismiss us now with your care and make us mindful of your presence as we leave this place tonight. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.